Their leader, Jesus of Nazareth, had just been executed. Twelve men in fear for their lives. And there was no place to hide. Yet these terrified men became the founders of a worldwide faith. So how do 12 regular folks from the backwoods of Galilee become these giants of history? The disciples. The disciples spread Jesus' message across the ancient world. Many of them sacrificed their lives for him. transformation of this tiny, threatened group into a world religion is a phenomenal story. But to understand it, we need to trace their journey from the very beginning. The disciples grew up in a land ripped apart by turmoil. As the first century dawns in Galilee, Jesus and the disciples are still just children when a band of men protesting about rising taxes and Roman rule stage an uprising in the key city of Sepphoris. The Romans immediately put down the revolt with complete destruction of the city and killed all the inhabitants or sold them as slaves. And it must be a memory which the locals kept for generations. It's no surprise then that Galilee was a hotbed of rebellion during the first century. Helen Bond has studied this social and historical background to the Bible. We know there were quite a lot of bandit leaders at about the time of Jesus. We hear of people taking to the hills and going and living in caves and where, where other people came to them and they, they led um, resistance movements against the Romans. The disciples grew up against this background. Some may even have witnessed the Sepphoris Rebellion. Perhaps in Jesus, they saw a leader who could free them from the Romans. Now, scientific and historical breakthroughs are giving us new insights into the lives of the disciples. The picture that's emerging of these 12 men is both vivid and surprising. One thing's clear from the outset, they came to Jesus for a set of very different reasons and with very different hopes. By the time the disciples were in their 20s, the first of those reasons may have been financial. Hefty taxes would have been a constant concern for the four disciples who worked as fishermen. James, brothers Peter and Andrew, and John.
we know that James and John, Peter and Andrew, were in a partnership from the Gospels, from Luke. So they are under a lot of pressure to catch the fish in order that they meet their obligations, both to feed the families and to pay the tax collector. The fishermen were forced into a contract with the tax collector to hand over their catch, including fresh fish like carp and sardines, in return for inferior salted fish. It was an unfair exchange bound to breed resentment. All of the fish have been counted from the catch, and the agents of the tax collector come and take that away to go to some of the tables of the rich people in the city. This amounted to enormous financial pressure. People longed for more control over their lives. They were looking for a leader to help them fight back. Maybe they thought that leader was Jesus. The initial followers of Jesus uh, were attracted to something very practical that dealt with daily life, that dealt with real issues. We would misconstrue it to call it uh, a purely religious movement. While some of the disciples may have joined the Jesus movement to challenge taxes, it doesn't explain why all 12 joined. In particular, it doesn't explain Matthew. Before Matthew became a disciple, he was a tax collector. We know about Matthew's job from the Gospels, but they don't tell us why he was attracted to Jesus. For one thing, unlike the fishermen, Matthew lived the comfortable life of a wealthy man. James Strange is an archaeologist whose excavations of ancient villages have helped to paint a picture of life in the first century. People who lived in any village in the Galilee, their houses from the outside would look absolutely identical. The only way you could have a luxury good would be inside the house. You might plaster a room very finely and paint it very nicely, but that's only for those inside the house. No one outside would have any idea unless they were invited in. The inside of Matthew's house would have shown that he was far wealthier than his neighbors. If Matthew were a low-level tax official and only had a few villages assigned to him, he would still be richer than anybody else in any of those villages. But his wealth would have made Matthew a hated figure in his community. This could have been the impetus for him to join Jesus. He would be really utterly alone. I mean, it would be very difficult for him to find people to have just ordinary socializing with. Uh, he'd be in a very precarious position. And I, I imagine, to tell you the truth, that he would probably also have to have bodyguards. When he joined the Jesus movement, Matthew turned his back on tax collecting and was welcomed, maybe for the first time, into a community. But perhaps the most puzzling disciple is also one of the most famous, Judas Iscariot. He's more of an enigma than Matthew. Judas has a bad reputation, untrustworthy and disloyal. But he was the disciple's treasurer, looking after donations to the group and organizing provisions. So here you have this band of disciples. They're living out of some kind of a common fund. And he apparently is the bursar. He handles all the accounts, keeps track of what we need. A quartermaster, if you... Uh, it, I, I think it involves some organizational ability, some trustworthiness, some leadership. So, far from being the bad boy, when Judas joined the Jesus movement, he must have been regarded as one of the most reliable members. 
Unfortunately, we know very little about the remaining disciples. There's Thomas and Philip, who's said to come from the same area as the fishermen. There's a Bartholomew and a Simon, known as the Zealot, probably because he was zealous about upholding Jewish religious law. But there's a controversial theory that Simon, along with Jude, and another disciple called James, were actually Jesus' brothers. They may have been stepbrothers rather than blood relatives. Nevertheless, some experts believe that they were part of Jesus' family. Whatever the blood ties between Jesus and some of his disciples, it's clear that these 12 men are very different from one another. Such variety might make an interesting group, but you'd think a radical movement such as this would need like-minded recruits. Kerry Cooper specializes in group psychology. We asked him to apply modern psychological principles to what we know about the disciples to find out how hard it would be for such a group to work together and become founders of a new faith. When I look at the disciples, I would have thought, as a psychologist, if I was just looking at the group being composed, I'd say disaster area. Coming from totally different kind of backgrounds, a tax collector, people who are revolted by the taxes, a zealot, all sorts of different characters, very different. Now, if they had a leader that could kind of resolve their differences and the potential conflicts that are gonna come on, on board, and got them to think about what the ultimate objective is and how that objective could meet their own personal needs, then it would work. These 12 men from such diverse backgrounds did have a strong leader in Jesus, and they had a mission. They may have been prepared to give working together a chance if it meant they would see some action against the Romans. But there's evidence that traveling together as a group may have been a harsh enough experience in the first century to put these very different personalities to the test. The 12 men we know as the disciples were a very mixed group united behind a strong, charismatic leader. But following Jesus was never going to be easy. Their fragile unity was about to face a tough test. Whatever their motives for joining this strange new movement, the disciples soon realized that life on the road with Jesus could be unpredictable and dangerous. Galilee is about 35 miles across. The disciples could walk it in a day or so. But the terrain can be rugged. In these places, there is little protection from the elements or from robbers. The life on the road is quite hard, actually. Uh, there are people who regard that as their territory sometimes, and they don't like you coming through. There are wild animals you have to think about. In the ancient world, actually lions and bears were the two prime predators you had to think of. As if life on the road wasn't dangerous enough, the Bible records that Jesus told the disciples to leave their possessions behind. Even so, there are some basics that experts believe they would have needed. For example, in very bad weather, you really need a wool mantle like this to uh, dress yourself in. You can wrap it tightly about yourself and sleep in it like a tent. You can also use it as a raincoat because it's, it is uh, uh, impervious to water. If someone is not friendly and has not given you fire, you have to have a way to make fire. You'll need a piece of iron and a piece of flint and a scorched piece of linen so that you can nap your own fire. 